This is a lecture on concrete. It's the fifth part of a series of lectures on masonry, stone, and concrete. In a section of the course, Architectural Materials and Methods in Instructional Language. There are 87 slides in this talk, and I'd like to keep it to about 50 minutes, so you, know, you can read ahead when I don't read all the material on the slide. Um, I'll come back and read it later. Reinforced concrete is um, an amalgamation of uh, concretion of things. Um, it wasn't reinforced initially when the Romans used it. Uh, it was uh, in his cement, aggregate, water, and additives. And now reinforced concrete is when we put um, steel in it, make it a composite material, and uh, that uh, Makes it reinforced. Um, cement, we'll talk about the, the cement part, is uh, Portland cement. It's almost always Portland cement in America and many places. Uh, seems kind of specific, but its historic origins are in England. Um, referring to a Portland stone. And we'll look at that, and that just stuck. You can see two standards here, the ASTM, which we use in the United States, American Society of Testing Materials. You can put in your specifications to go in your sets of your drawings and specifications to go with the project. And then you see the European standard and the definition here. Defined by each. There are different types of Portland cement based on classification characteristic and applications. We're starting up with general purpose, and um, that's applied for general construction of the buildings, bridges, pavements. It's the most common. And then some more specific ones, um, different strength and uh, other properties that you may want to specify. The aggregate in the concrete is a structural filler. It can range from fine grain sand to rocks, different sizes. The composition, shape, and size of the aggregate affects the concrete's workability, durability, strength, weight, and shrinkage. This is a quarry located in southeastern Pennsylvania, near Elizabethtown College, between uh, the cities of Harrisburg and Lancaster City. Here is a closer look at the quarry, and you can see the road winding down to uh, where you get the aggregate and up the trucks. Piled up. This is a quote by Frank Lloyd Wright saying that uh, when he grew up in the countryside in Taliesin, was in the workshop or in Wisconsin. Um, it's uh, geologically the bed of an ancient glacier drift, and gravel pits around, uh, and uh, he speaks of. Uh, the emotion that he feels, you know, the whitened, dust whitened stretches of cement mills grinding to impalpable fineness, the magic powder that would set my vision all to shape, he says. I wish both mill and gravel endlessly subject to my will. Materials, exclamation, what a resource. So he would use these materials. Uh, Different times in his life, different to different degrees. Um, I'm famous that these people know the Guggenheim, falling water. But he had many, many works of art and architecture throughout his life. It was a 70-year career. He died in 1959. So uh, water is a very critical ingredient in cement and concrete. 
the cement is, is materials. Um, so it binds, what the water does, it uh, binds the aggregate together and it causes hardening of the concrete through a process called hydration. And uh, there's typically a 28 day strength uh, is the goal. And you'll we'll see in a second, keeping water in is important uh, to, to get that strength. Um, however, there's initial water content where you don't want too much. So it's a balance there. You want to keep the water in for a long time, but you don't want too much initially. And so if you're an engineer going on a project or an architect, you want to test the strength of the concrete for something called a slump test. This is what it looks like. You put the concrete in a metal cone, you pack it in there, and then you turn it upside down quickly, pull it off, and you see how much it slumps down, and that correlates directly to uh, the strength of the concrete. Now, we do want to keep the water in that's in there. And if you don't, you're going to uh, have less strength. So this is a graph showing uh, the curing process. So curing is keeping water in. And typically, you want to uh, try to reach for a 28-day strength if you can. Uh, you know, most of the time, people just leave it and try to keep the water in. But there's different methods. And long ago, 30 years ago, when I go to job sites, I'd see hay bales. in a certain desert climates in Texas and California, where they dry very quickly. So curing, keeping water in to get strength. Now we measure a compressive strength uh, with concrete. Concrete has a very relatively high compressive strength and we're going to put steel in it for a tensile strength. Go back and look at the structural lecture in the beginning of this course, we'll see more on that. We'll talk about more also here. Um, and so you see a 28-day compressive strength. And now this is based on a mix there. And so uh, we're going to talk about that. And you can drill down into that a little more if you like on your own. Um, but you can see the, the different strength at the different times in the laboratory and then just working with it in a, in a control setting. Um, you also see here on a graph, you see a picture of a, a cylinder, and paid for a little bit of my undergrad working near a research lab doing just this kind of thing, testing core samples, different concretes with different mixtures. We had polymer impregnated concretes where we had resin. So I was just an undergrad, a grad student professor had a grant from um, Quaker Oats to do something with the corn husks. And so it turns out if you, you can uh, cook it and get a, a resin out, a gooey resin, you can put that into the concrete, it gives it some better properties. So the more tensile strength and also resilience, ductility and flexibility to understand your structural properties. Uh, you see a graph here of compressive strength versus uh, water to cement ratio, right? So it's the water content, we know, certainly affects it. You also see on, on there an AE, that's for air and train. We'll talk about that in a second. So here is air and train concrete. And the idea is you put some air in there, some little bubbles. And then it's uh, for freeze thaw resistance. So the air voids provide pressure release. Um, sites during a freeze event on um, the water side the concrete so it's a freeze without you know, large internal stresses because you know, water uh, is incompressible for any of you who've studied fluid mechanics air is compressible so you give it a little place to compress and it wants to transfer those stress concentrations places where you end up with cracks uh, so also below here, uh, if you could uh, you know, later on, pause this if you like, you do it now if you're reading this on your own sometime. Um, read this, uh, read at this link here. It's specific civil engineering things. The civil engineers are going to be most interested in that, and architectural engineers 
you know, architects too, but this is the details, um, very specific details that uh, where you would get an engineer involved with like high rise or roadways or dams, something of very large magnitude where somebody has to focus just on the task at hand here in a, in a highly concentrated way. The architect has a million things to juggle. And the engineers should focus very clearly, and precisely on one thing. That's why they get paid to consult. So the mixed design uh, is a very specific thing. So if you're a civil engineer or an architectural engineer, you have had a series of courses and structures and one just on reinforced concrete design, in addition to many other structural courses. You have 11 undergraduate degrees architectural engineering and 11 structural courses, one specifically on uh, reinforced concrete with a separate lab and doing these, these mixes here, something we did. But it's time consuming and, uh, and you can see there's many things that you need to uh, think about. So um, there's a video, previous slide if you go on that video, you can, you can click on this mix design and see more about it, but skim through that get the basic understanding of that. Now additives, we've talked about uh, in concrete, the cement, the aggregate and water. Now additives for a number of things. Um, uh, retarding means to slow down the uh, curing or the hardening process, but you may want to do that uh, if you, uh, you can do that actually on the forms. You could put the uh, retarder on the forms so the forms come off easy, or if you want to do exposed aggregates, you can do it uh, on the form and then uh, wash off the uh, concrete and then the main mass is set to a certain extent that the, the surface is still hardening because it's being retarded. Um, air entrainment, we mentioned that, but you know, get an air in, reduce some water, accelerating, right? You can make it sort of faster. And then uh, shrink reducing, plasticizers, corrosion inhibiting. Uh, you can click on this link below here. Whenever you see a link in this in this series of lectures, it means that it's probably something you want to drill down into. I'm not citing every you know, possible random photo that I get off the internet. I am citing though, however, the course textbook that we are using. Like in this slide, you see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, you see a figure number that is a reference to uh, that book. So uh, here's a table, and this is comparing wood to brick masonry, to steel, and to concrete. And you can see uh, uh, tension strength, you know, strength and tension, that's tensile strength, you know, the compression strength next, modulus elasticity and density. The uh, two, two most important, uh, and modulus elasticity is important too for deflections, we often can roll this. You know, what you're doing, if you don't want to deflect too much, even it's not going to fail. Uh, however, we're talking about a composite material here of uh, concrete with high compression strength and steel with high tension tensile strength. And so you can look at those numbers there and imagine why you put these two materials together, a composite material, which is reinforced concrete. So you see in this slide here, uh, a beam that is in flexure and uh, uh, the load from above and the top part of that beam is being compressed, the bottom part in tension. So if you look at a cross section of that beam, you can see why you put the concrete, uh, well the concrete's through, throughout, but the concrete is actually doing the most uh, structural effort in the top part and then the steel is in there for tensile strength and third at the bottom of the beam that's in, uh, in flexure like this. So we'll be uh, referring to the reinforcing steel as rebar. This is a common industry standard, which is slang. It's uh, rebar, adding tensile strength. And you can see here uh, how it's manufactured in the rolling mill. Just, just like it sounds, it's still just rolled and continuous band, hot molten steel, curving along there. See that picture cut at points, and then um, <coughs> a pattern 
put into the surface, the deformation is put into the surface uh, to help it bond tightly to the concrete you know, on slipping around. Sets. Uh, here's a couple more uh, figures from the book um, on building construction. And we can see the different sizes. Three, four, five, how it corresponds to uh, diameter. And what its weight per pound, or its weight in pounds per foot is. And then you can see how it's labeled in the image on the right here. Decipher exactly what you've got in your hand when you're looking at a piece of it. This is how it uh, is uh, bent and bending in a fabrication shop. So, if you're making some complex uh, high rise steel cages to put in columns and uh, you know, reinforcing the rebar, uh, you need to. Uh, fabrication shop involved typically on small projects you won't but larger ones you definitely will in very large ones and you can see here a uh, cross section of the footing and a wall with valves uh, and uh, how the rebar lays out And here is a large reinforcing cage, so you can imagine this is a very large structure. Let's see, very detailed work, skilled work. You know, on this size job, you don't want to just have laborers doing these. These are all trained, skilled people that do just this as they and they're following specifications from an engineer, most certainly on this size project. You know, architects would not typically specify that steel on the size project you can solve with a structural engineer which can be civil or architectural engineer but they're licensed as a structural engineer uh, it varies by state you know, in california you have to be specific their instructions here's another image a three-dimensional image of a footing and column and this is a spread footing holding Column um, looks like it's carrying a great bit of load from above, break the load, and uh, putting this um, good size thickness. It looks like that's bearing quite a bit of weight. And the amount of steel I see in this column is an indication of this little bit of structure above. Uh, the beam to column connections you can see here the details of, the, of doing that these are actually precast uh, pieces that um, have uh, you weld them together and you have to, you have to cast them mm, they, those well those plates those connection plates have to be well thought out and precisely designed to connect to the structure of steel within the reinforced concrete so there's a lot of engineering that goes on here. And this is from this book here, and you can see the, the, uh, the image of the load above here, which forces a uniformly distributed load on the beam above, and how those uh, forces are internally distributed and depicting it in that image. And then the resulting steel that you would put in there. As we mentioned, you can imagine mid span of the beam is a critical point for some flexure, and then steel below, tensile strength. And then uh, you also need steel in other places for shear strength. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you can get uh, your Revit software that we have. Uh, to design reinforced concrete and for tall buildings and complex loads, you really should have a great a licensed professional engineer. So I'm telling you this from experience. Having done structural engineering in California, having contracted structural engineers, 
Uh, it's not something you want to do quickly if it's a large complex structure under uh, complex loads, especially in seismic areas. Here's uh, some steel we see inside of a column. And you can do shapes. And now some images I'm familiar with, having lived in California for five years and worked with supervising large construction projects for developers, and also working in a consulting firm for engineering, doing structural specifications, and spending every uh, Christmas for the past 30 years, going back and forth from there. It's not the Christmas time. Uh, which I drive on these highways all the time, and I was uh, amazed that uh, the engineering of it, as well as uh, a little worried about how it will react during an earthquake, especially when I'm driving under this thing here, which I hope I do. This is some of the view that uh, I'm familiar with down below. And so, on those decks above. And so uh, there's very good engineering here, and it's advanced quite a bit since uh, I worked there long ago. This is an example of a structural failure in highway design in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, during the Loma Prieta earthquake, magnitude 6.9. I was uh, the year before working for a structural environmental engineering firm, did some uh, small structural specifications in Bay Area Rapid Transit stations and on elementary schools in San Francisco and high school structural specifications and then environmental specifications throughout the Bay Area from all the way from Santa Cruz to uh, up into the Bay Area. Uh, Santa Cruz was actually the epicenter of this earthquake and um, then the uh, seismic waves traveled up here uh, doing most of the damage where the subsurface conditions were more unstable and uh, caused liquefaction, which is where the soil acts like a liquid and um, the uh, structures suffer because of it. So as you can see what happened here, the concrete Part of the reinforced concrete crumbled away under dynamic load, leaving essentially a spaghetti of steel reinforcing bar to hold up the load. And the most critical design failure here, which the most critical aspect was at this connection between the vertical and horizontal under dynamic load and the upper deck, the tremendous load there, just shearing uh, through the horizontal vertical connection and uh, causing all the casualties. At the time, the loads here, seismic loads, were modeled just as a uh, lateral wedge of force um, uh, proportion to the dynamic or proportionate to the, to the height of the uh, structure and of the magnitude of the earthquake that the line for approximately up to a seven was what was thought of to be designed to this was a 6.9 actually it was more like 7.4 was thought to be uh what it was designed to however there was not dynamic modeling until after this earthquake where you, know, you actually consider the vibrations or the building code considers the oscillating nature of seismic loading was, which was what ultimately cracked the concrete off and left just the rebar holding up this. Uh, fast forward from uh, 1989 to a uh, happier memory in 2002, 13 years later. And this is in uh, Pennsylvania recent projects <clears throat> and this is my son you can see here age four or five and we're um, we are making he's making 
these uh, bolsters, they're called to prop up the uh, rebar so that it's not lying on the bottom of the trench when uh, we do the concrete pour. It was the concrete mix truck. And one of the only two things I subcontracted on this, I mean, I had you know, it's a labor of love, this particular project to have over 5,000 man hours into the project myself, plus my son's working with me. And then John for a week doing labor in the dirt and Dax Kepshire, a um, student went on to start a company and get his master's and PhD. Did some labor work and trade for some robotics tutoring. Uh, anyway, that's uh, other stories for other times. This is rebar, and we're talking about rebar and propping it up in the trench so that when you do the concrete pour, um, it doesn't sit on the bottom. It needs to be located up into the section of uh, the footing or the beam or whatever you're doing. It needs to be placed very precisely. Um, when you do your structural analysis, your strength of materials analysis, right, your moment of inertia and everything else for your structural calculation, you need to, uh, the very precise locations where the steel is, the composite material, steel and concrete, they're very different materials, uh, different properties, you know, tensile strength of the steel, compression strength of the concrete. And so um, you need them precisely located and to stay put. Uh, you know, first of all, position right where you want them up, and then also have them stay put. So in added precaution here, uh, I'm using these, uh, we're using these electrical ties to tie, uh, plastic electrical ties to tie the rebar to the uh, bolsters. So when the concrete pour truck comes and the concrete's just flowing through and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a dynamic situation, but we move the rebar around. And so this is the bottom of our trenches for our footings, um, the continuous uh, footing here, uh, uh, below the frost line, of course, but uh, not stepping it either, so that it's nice continuous or continuous structural element. Um, and it very uniformly distributes the load of the two and a half story new structure. It doesn't bear weight on the old 1877 farmhouse. Uh, and that was also done because of the this similar soils of sand and clay. The next few slides are some uh, random pictures off of the internet. First here, a simple footing kind of uh, formwork. This looks like a warmer climate where you're not putting the footings down, down deep, unless this is a big giant. Uh, excavated area. Just making the footings first. Uh, well, whatever it is, this wood formwork here is pretty simple. Doesn't really need to be engineered so much. Steel, maybe not so much calculations. You get something of this scale, you're going to need an engineer to uh, do the calculations. The hydrostatic pressure of the concrete in the forms can easily blow out the forms or bow it at the least. And the bigger the project, the more need for a consulting engineer. The engineer may be an employee of the subcontractor that does this kind of work since this is a large scale project and could justify a full time engineer and staff. And the structural engineer could specify this also, but typically I don't believe that's the case in my experiences of the contractors, if they're experienced enough, can design them and create their own formwork. Here's a curved wall, again, an engineered kind of thing, a retaining wall in this case, which itself needs to be engineered to hold up the load, the lateral load of the dirt, and the overturning moment is where it was, the lateral load, and the hydrostatic pressure of the water cable behind. Um, and the formwork itself needs to be engineered. What you see uh, going across between the pieces of wood here, you know, with big long forms, is called a form tie. And this is a picture of that, and the, different, you know, the two sides together so, they don't, so the wall doesn't blow out. 
right? Well, in a nice smooth plumb continuous surface as intended. If you're repeating the, uh, the shape that you're making with the concrete, it's a good idea to have you know, forms that can be reused. So you can see that uh, here. It's up in the air there above the bridge, but it was used underneath to form each of those four arches that make up this bridge. You also have these uh, throwaway uh, cardboard tubes. Not throwaway, it's the, they cut them away when they're done. Uh, they're not, not meant to be reusable, and it's easier than trying to uh, build a form from scratch to cast this kind of shape. If you're working on large high rise buildings, you don't want to go too high typically with concrete. You go pretty high, but not hundreds of stories typically. Not like hundreds of stories. But you can go pretty high with concrete nowadays. And this is one, one way to do it, an efficient way to do it. This is a slip form, self climbing form, where you cast it as you're moving up. And it needs to move pretty slowly. You got to give it time to set, at least to hold its shape. I don't know to, you know, not to leave it there 28 days, but uh, you need to leave it there so that it's hard enough and doesn't slump and pull the form up. And a couple more pictures of what that might look like, different types of structures. Now we want to talk about the uh, delivery of the concrete to the job site from a batch plant. So you order so many cubic yards of concrete and you deliver it. It's very specifically when you say, well, typically in the morning or afternoon, come out with several loads, and go pick up several loads at a time. And uh, imagine a truck pulling here. You can come back and take a look at this video if you like, or it depends when you're watching it, just stop and watch the video now if you like of, uh, of how this works in operation. You want to keep your trenches dry when uh, you're doing your concrete pour. This is where we were waiting uh, for the concrete truck to come. Um, recent project in the 2000s. This millennium. And here's the pour. Four cubic yards. 4,000 PSI concrete. And this is a random picture of the internet, but you can get an idea. Mix truck, I was too busy helping put it in place. And the mix truck shows up, but uh, you got to help push the concrete around. And then it's also vibrating it somewhat and tamping it, mixing it in the trench to get the air bubbles out. It's a good idea to do that because it's uh, you know, plus you're pushing it around with the shovel. The mix truck can only get so close to the trench. We've talked about this before during the foundations lecture, but uh, to do it by hand, we would have required 235 60 pound bags, and uh, that's not a wise thing to attempt yourself. Unless you're going to make a, a, you know, a discontinuous, non homogeneous core that's going to be drying in different sections at different times. And so you have a you know, crew. You just couldn't do it. You just, you know, it doesn't matter how many people, you couldn't do it fast enough. To make it as uniform as one concrete pour, continuous pour from a batch truck. On larger projects, you want to have a pumper. So, this is what you would do on a big project, and, and uh, it comes out pretty rapidly. Another picture of that. Perhaps you go to hard to reach places also. And this is the project, and a recent project, and two adjacent courses I own. 
It's one lot essentially, but it's parsed into two pieces. And um, you can see the, the project was in back. It's actually completed with this Google image. And this was before the project was completed. And so you can see that the truck uh, needed to get back around the corner. It was a kind of precarious maneuvering, considering that we were the first pour in the morning. It had been drizzling a little bit. Ground was soft. The truck had several batches for other jobs. It was loaded full and had to make a steep turn in between the two buildings. You see a garage on the left up there and main house, houses connected with white. Right. The truck came through there and had to make a turn to the left and came from the other side. Uh, here's just another, uh, another mixer machine or a pump pumping to the upper decks with this building. This is something you want to do after the concrete pour. You want to get the air out. And this is different than air and train concrete where you're injecting tiny little bubbles to allow for freeze fall without cracking. That's a different thing. Uh, when you do a pour and it's a uh, you know, big enough pour that you have some uh, large volume, there can be air bubbles and the aggregate can be uh, you know, creating pockets. And so you don't want to um, have those and you want to vibrate them out. Now, on my personal projects, I just, you can do it. You can just kind of tamp it out and certain tools. But in large projects, I supervise and watch professional contractors that do this for a living. They have equipment to, to vibrate. Now, this is something that I was very much involved with in San Diego, specifically Hoya, in San Diego County for a project, a large uh, project that I supervised for a high tech company for, for developers as the owner's representative, we coordinated all of the architecture, and engineering, and construction, negotiated a $10 million dollar contract for this, and it was big project with these tilt up uh, concrete slabs so you cast them on the ground and then tilt them up this is not a picture of them this is a picture from elsewhere and uh this is a book you can see there in the bottom right hand corner and the idea of casting on the ground you need special lifting rings and lifting steel you have to engineer this this needs to be engineered just as the plain flat one needs to be engineered uh, just to lift it you can imagine the forces on this as you're bending it up dynamic forces and these odd forces this isn't just a wall with the normal loads that were there later on this is a even if it's just a facade it's it's Got quite a bit of weight and can fail just in lifting if it's not engineered carefully. So this is the project, um, my project, and uh, this was um, you can see a mixture of uh, glass curtain wall, full blue glass that just came out. We got about a million dollars of that, and then this um, this uh, concrete. And it wasn't just regular tilt up. So in the beginning, uh, I just got with everybody, the architects and engineers, and tried to do something really interesting. This ended up winning actually an award in San Diego. You can see it a little more closely here. Uh, and so to get these extra thick walls, and that was one of the things that. Uh, I was really advocating for was to make it not just a thin, plain tilt up slab that you would see often in these industrial parks. This was a work of art to be. Yeah. 
here are some standard ways to uh, create concrete buildings in site cast as uh, compared to uh, precast, which we'll talk about, which can be manufactured. So you know, those tilt up slabs were site cast also, but they were precast on site and then tilted up. And when you normally um, talk about pulling in place, you're not moving it, you're setting up some formwork, you cast it, you place, place the concrete, pull the concrete, place it, and then pull your formwork off and reuse them or throw them away depending on the project. There's some different forms here, and you can see the different names of them. Two-way slab, two-way slab with panels, sure capitals, two-way slab plate, and waffle slab. Now, this is a precast in a factory. Um, Structural member. It's actually a facade in this case. It looks like it's not much load bearing, but regardless, it's an engineered section, unit, recast, and factory. And that's a good way to guarantee quality control. Not that the people on the job aren't well trained professionals, but just in a controlled factory setting, you can really control materials and the curing time and precision. Automation. Here's another precast uh, element with uh, glass built in, which is nice. It takes quite a bit of time to put windows in any kind of construction. Here are some precast shapes. Um, Concrete tees, some of the Schlosser dorms on the the town college made of these. It actually had some problem with erosion due to leaking showers and structural engineer come and take a look at them that they didn't erode the rebar and the structural steel. So there's different shapes here, solid, flat slab, hollow pier slab, double T, single T's. Common in larger scale construction. Precast. Some other precast shapes. Um, you often see these more in road construction and parking garages, but certainly can use them in larger buildings. Here's an interesting example of a stadium in precast uh, concrete stairs. You can imagine the formwork it would, try, it would take to do this in place. You can do this in a controlled setting where you're making presumably more stairways for other jobs. It's much more efficient. Now we talked about precast, we talk about pre-stressed. So what you do is you, you make the concrete, you place it, then uh, and you, you let it set, and harden, and cure, and then you pre-stress it. You can see in the bottom image here, that you're creating a bow to it, a camber to it, so that when it, it's put in place, like you can see in this slide, it deflects down to a flat surface. So that's the idea here. You know, it would normally have a sag just from its own weight, uh, and then, you know, so heavy, you have a deflection, and you want to, to take that out before you, know, you put it in place. And then you know, under its own load, and then whatever typical finishing materials and live load, uh, you know, mostly just to compensate for its own weight, deflection due to its own weight, you should zero out with a flatness that's uh, desirable as specified. Now we want to talk about post-tension. It's a little different. And here you uh, place it in, in place and then uh, on site and then on site and then tension. Okay. 
before we show an example of that, there's a number of slides here that you take a look at later on. A lot of, I put a lot of detail in these slides just because it's an important topic. It's the outcomes that you're specifying, the levelness for the full levelness and uh, flatness for different things. A little history of how that used to be done with the straight edge, 10 foot straight edge, and then the gap underneath the straight edge. Then these factors for the levelness factor and for flatness factors. And so you want to get a feel for that. You can read that. See the relative difference in quality here between conventional and super flat. Get a feel for these numbers that you will specify as an engineer or architect. And then probably the most important slide is you know, when do you specify these given things? You can see a non-critical space here and the number of usages there where you're not worried about it that much up to the more sensitive for the more stringent requirements for flatness and levelness. Here is an example of post-tension concrete. This is a repair project from Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Fallen Water in Western Pennsylvania. A brilliant piece of architecture where we did have structural problems over time. This is what needed to be done. It's a little hard to tell what was old and what's new here, but it essentially needed to be retrofit with the post tensioning. Floors of the decks, outside deck is torn up here. You can see the cables for the post tensioning. And the entire interior floor. Is can leave the section of the house need to be torn up. And quite a bit of labor and technology to do this in an engineered way. It's quite expensive. This is a field trip that uh, took the architectural students on five years ago from when this is being recorded in 2020. Initially, and uh, Professor Classroom King lives there in the summer and sees a tour guide. Here is a design manual for post-tensioning of reinforced concrete. Uh, my son sent me this right after initially reading, um, listening to this lecture, and I've added these slides. Uh, this is on uh, falling water, and it has some details here that I've uh, excerpted on the next page you can take a look at. So please read through this and uh, some interesting things to note in here was that the cantilevers were uh, sagging as much as six, seven inches out of level. Well, that's, that's pretty significant. Um, and also the, uh, the forces needed on the tendons where they mentioned 390 kips uh, kips is a thousand pounds of uh, force, so that's 390,000 pounds of force uh, was one was the high um, stress level that they had to put uh, to get the sag out of these cantilevers, and they did it all within a 10-week period. So that's quite a, a feat, considering they had to tear everything apart 
set up the structural work, uh, implement this post-tensioning, which is a complicated technical task, and then rebuild uh, the finishes. Uh, please take a look at the link below here at the bottom of this slide and uh, uh, skim through the post-tensioning design manual. This is a field trip that uh, took the architectural students on five years ago from when this was being recorded in 2020, initially. And uh, Professor Cosmo King lives there in the summer and sees a tour guide and studies Frank Lloyd Wright. The two of us are planning to teach a, a course on Frank Lloyd Pictures of uh, students, faculty, architecture. I didn't plan this particular picture, but I it seemed, seemed fitting the waterfall and how it fit into the picture. So look at people taking pictures. So people pictures of people taking pictures. I can do that actually in a lot of places. Capture something unique, I believe. Here is another masterpiece of Frank Lloyd Wright here in Guggenheim, in New York City. Now, it's worth mentioning about concrete finishes, different ways to do that. You can do this with your forms, the way you, uh, you can have decorative forms when you place your concrete. And then you can also if you want exposed aggregate, like you see in the letter C there, the third one, you can put a decelerator on the form, which makes it so the concrete is setting up slower. And then you pull the forms off, and the mass of the structure is pretty much set. And you can hose off the surface and get a nice exposed aggregate. And to wrap up this lecture, uh, I want to mention one uh, somewhat novel technique. Uh, I haven't seen this done on uh, large scale projects, but it seems like a somewhat newer thing to do. It's called aircrete. And so you'll see, uh, you can see the different uh, types of shapes and forms you can do here with structural properties they have also, which you'll hear about when you listen to the video. So I'd like you to listen to this guy. He and his wife are doing this. Now he has expertise. He's actually, you know, it seems to have some good respectable expertise in concrete before ever doing this kind of thing himself. But if, as you watch the video, just watch uh, what he talks about. And uh, you can see he's showing as an example in the back there, this reflectual strength behind him in that picture. He's moving a bunch of uh, 60 or maybe 80, 60 pound bags, probably. So, so 100 pounds, and there's no reinforcing steel in this. Well, there is a, uh, I take that back, there's actually a wire mesh that he puts in there. So, there is, you know, somewhat, uh, but it's still a relatively strong and perhaps more importantly, uh, lightweight and uh, easy to assemble, easy workable product. As you can see, his wife himself lifting this. You would not do that with a normal piece of concrete. That would be way too heavy for you. The strongest of people to be doing that kind of thing. 